Hello everyone, my name is Sam Illingworth. I'm a senior lecturer in science communication at the University of Western Australia. And in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking to you about using poetry and games to develop dialogue between scientists and non-scientists. And I really would encourage any of you to reach out to me, get in contact with me via Twitter or via my website and love to hear your thoughts on this and the things I'll be talking about as well. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to start with a hypothesis that I'm going to try to answer. Um, so the hypothesis that I want to try and address in this short presentation is poetry and games can be used to engender dialogue, giving voice to those audiences that are normally underheard and underserved by science and science and communication. So we're going to start with poetry and then go on to look at games as well. So starting with poetry, I just want to introduce you to one of the poetry projects that I've been running for several years now. And that is a blog I run called The Poetry of Science. And the idea behind this blog is that every week I read a new piece of scientific research and try to write a poem about it that aims to communicate that to a new audience. And the idea being really that it's about introducing people who wouldn't necessarily see this research to the relevance of science, but also just to the fact that science is interesting, cool, bizarre, strange, arresting, scary at times. And so what I try to do is to widen this research to audiences that might not normally find it. So to give you an example of what that might look like in practice, um, there was a fantastic paper published towards the end of last year in Nature Communications that looked at the impact of tides and sea level on deep sea Arctic methane emissions. So this idea that actually the moon uh, is responsible for the tides on the earth and the tides can then actually, depending on whether it's low tide or high tide, have an impact on the amount of methane that is potentially emitted from deep sea trenches of methane at the bottom of the seabed, which could have huge implications for global climate change. And this is a brilliant paper, beautifully written. Uh, if we look at the abstract to the right, though, we can see, you know, this is a really well written scientific abstract, but for a non-expert or even a non-specialist, it, it can be a little bit difficult to pass. So, for example, if you weren't a non-expert, how would you know that what is meant by here we report on the first continuous pore pressure and temperature measurements over four days in shallow sediments along the West Svalbard margin? You might not. But this research is actually really relevant to many, many people. And it's just exciting and interesting. So I wrote a poem that doesn't, it doesn't try to exactly convey the research. What it tries to do is to get a, a semblance of the idea of what's there and to encourage people to find out more about it. So this is the poem that I wrote. Ancient forces dredge secrets from beneath the seabed, undulating stimuli, unearthing memories of a long buried past rising and falling with the passing tide, dark shadows threaten to break free from subterranean prison cells, shifting pressures, blossoming cracks across crumbling, ill-fitting barricades. We hold our breath and pray that the waters will hold them. So this is a great example, in my opinion, of science communication where using poetry as a way of bringing scientific research to new audiences. And you can check out my blog here and also the accompanying podcast as well. And this is what I would say is a good example of a one way method of science communication. I'm the person who's communicating it. I've determined what's interesting. I've thought about my audience, but it's basically a one way method of communication. Me imparting knowledge to other people filling a deficit of somebody else's information, if you will. And yes, it does it in a relatively innovative and um, accessible format, but it's still not necessarily a dialogue. It's, it's a one-way method of communication. So how can we use poetry instead as a way of developing two-way dialogue? By which I mean, how can we get scientists and non-scientists to exchange ideas. So it's not just scientists telling non-scientists about their research, but it's non-scientists telling scientists what their experiences are, what their needs are, and how that can actually be used to shape fundamental research as well. 
And I believe that poetry actually offers a really powerful way of doing this. So one of the things that we need to overcome when we're developing dialogue is leveling hierarchies. So what I call hierarchies of intellect. So if you imagine we bring together scientists and non-scientists, and we've got a great group of scientists, really non-patronizing, extremely affable, accessible, and we bring together them in a room with some non-scientists and start to have some dialogue. Now, unfortunately, what can happen is that sometimes those non-scientists can be intimidated or feel as though maybe they don't have as valid an opinion on a subject because they don't have 20 letters after their name or X number of degrees. However, in many situations, a non-scientist's opinions, needs and experiences are extremely valid and extremely um, important to take into consideration you know we might see this for example when we're developing flood risk mitigation strategies if we're going to work with a local community we need to understand their needs their experiences etc because without them how could we possibly hope to better understand how our flood risk mitigation strategies are actually going to be imparted in that region so we need we need to work with non-scientists as well as scientists in order to get their lived experiences and needs but we need to do it in such a way that people feel valued and people feel as this the dialogue can take place so we need to level these hierarchies and poetry is a really powerful way of doing this in particular writing poetry between scientists and non-scientists and it's not about the aesthetic quality of the poetry it's about the process and by writing poems together and then using those poems as the starting points for discussion, what we find is that actually it levels these hierarchies and, and it works effectively for three reasons. One, it gives permission to the non-scientists that what they have to say is valid. You can't really correct a poem. Two, it gives permission to the scientists to display an element of pathos that they're not normally allowed to do. You know, as scientists, we have to talk in cold, hard facts which is incredibly damaging to the relationship between scientists and the rest of society. And thirdly, it creates this sense of shared vulnerability through which um, meaningful discussion can take place. You know, so if you've seen a, a professor stand up and deliver a really bad haiku, then you think to yourself, oh, actually, you know, she's fallible after all, and she's one of us, and we're all the kind of same, we're all part of this society. So poetry is a really powerful way of doing that. This is a paper um, that was published a couple of years ago that looks at a um, study that I did um, with my colleague Kirsten Jack in several different audience groups in the United Kingdom, um, especially those that are maybe underserved and underheard by traditional science and science communication means. So we work with people who have many different identities, but some of whom identified as refugees, asylum seekers, people living with mental health needs. And we know that with environmental change and climate change, these communities are going to be the ones that are probably the most affected by large scale environmental change and climate change, but also they're the communities that are maybe not actually contributing to those negative effects so much themselves. So it's really important that we hear these voices so that we can better understand what their understandings of environmental and climate change are but also so that we can use that with the scientists to help develop better mitigation strategies and, and, and to fundamentally understand how things are changing. So in this particular study, we went to lots of different groups. We wrote poetry together with scientists and non-scientists and then used that as a starting point to develop these dialogues. I'm just gonna share one poem with you. It's, it's very short, um, but it was written in a group in inner Manchester of people living with mental health needs. And um, in these sessions, we just talked about what other the groups wanted to talk about. And in this session, I wanted to talk about air pollution. So we talked about air pollution. Then I asked them to write a poem about you know, their understanding of air pollution um, after we'd had a little bit of a discussion about it with experts or scientists who worked in the field of air pollution. And this is what one of them wrote. I've never seen pollution, never noticed it. It's always been here, but I'm unaware of it just breathing it in. And for me, those five lines are incredibly powerful and, and, and they were to the scientists in the room as well as they demonstrate, you know, the vulnerability of some of these audiences. I'm in a very privileged position where um, if I knew that the air pollution in my area was particularly bad, I might be able to move, or at least I know that the air pollution is bad. 
However, what about those communities who don't know that the air pollution is bad? This particular community live just off one of the busiest bus routes in Europe where the air pollution is unquestionably bad. So this research is really necessary because it helps to give voice to those audiences that are often neglected and yet who are often the most impacted by the decisions um, and choices that are made by the rest of society. And poetry is a really powerful way to start to give voice to these audiences and to start to develop dialogue between scientists and non-scientists. I just want to talk briefly as well about a journal that I set up last year called Consilience. And this is a place where um, people who want to create poetry about the intersections between science um, and the arts or just science more generally can come and meet. And I think a lot of the times people are pigeonholed into boxes as you're a scientist, you're a poet, you're an artist, whereas actually we're just all human beings with limitless potential. Um, and so we created this space where people can come and, and share their work. And this journal, actually, it's the first science and poetry peer reviewed journal in the world. Uh, and we don't desk reject poems. So a lot of poetry journals, they, the poem when it's submitted is either perfect or completely imperfect, which is nonsensical. So what we do is we, we accept all of the poems that we get but we work with the poets and the, our editors and our reviewers um, to help them to improve their work and to develop their work. We accept poems from people at all stages of their poetic careers. And um, please visit our website and also check out our Facebook group. Always looking for new reviewers and new editors to take uh, to join the team. We have about 45 members on the editorial and reviewer um, panel from six continents. We're just missing Antarctica. So if anybody, works in Antarctica, please do come and join us. Um, and it's an open invite for you to come and look at ways in which you can develop your own poetic voice and think about ways in which we can help to break down these barriers between what people are and are not allowed to be. Um, so please do come and check us out. And you know, this brings to an end this first section of my talk, which I'm talking about poetry as a way to start thinking about how we can develop two-way dialogues between scientists and non-scientists. So the next section I'd like to talk about is games. And in particular, I'd like to talk about tabletop games. So lots of work's been done on the use of digital games and computer games, et cetera, in developing dialogue and thinking about science communication. And, and I, I am a huge video gamer as well, but my research interests lie in, in tabletop games. So analog games, games that you literally play around a tabletop, board games, card games, role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. Why tabletop games? Well, as I say here, the strength of tabletop games lies in the creation of a safe space in which to engage in discussions of complex and at times contentious topics and in enabling people to take control of their own learning. So what I mean by this to give you, what I mean by this is basically when we play tabletop games, we negotiate contracts with the people that we're playing the games with and by negotiating these contracts we're able to set aside maybe um, hierarchies or relationships that exist away from the tabletop and create new ones that then enable difficult conversations to take place and by difficult i mean conversations that we might not normally have i.e conversations around specific scientific topics or just science more generally so to give you an example of what I mean with a terrible game, but a good example, imagine we're playing Monopoly. Now, if we were playing Monopoly, which please don't do because it's not a good game. Um, if we were playing Monopoly, it would be perfectly okay and indeed encourageable for me to try and bankrupt you so that I can win the game. However, that kind of behavior is morally repugnant away from the tabletop. But when we're playing at the tabletop, we've negotiated a contract in which this is acceptable. So in game studies parlance, people call this the magic circle. It's, it's a space in which certain behaviors and attitudes and understandings are acceptable that are not away from the tabletop. And when we negotiate these contracts, we can, we can create a space in which dialogue can take place. Again, as I mentioned, video games are, are a great place for science communication to occur, but tabletop games have, I think, an advantage over digital games in that you have this face-to-face -face interaction, you have a tactility, you know, throwing dice, touching cardboard. And also, um, as I'll talk about in a second, tabletop games are very easily 
moddable. So if you want to go and modify a um, AAA video game to make it more scientifically relevant, it's very hard to do that. You're probably breaching several copyright infringements and you need exceptional skills in terms of programming and software. However, to modify a tabletop game, you just need a pen and paper. And it's a great way of getting games that already exist and thinking about how can we modify them to start talking about scientific topics. So to give you an example of this, let's look at Catan. So Catan is one of the world's most popular games. And um, for those of you who don't know, basically it's a game in which you all play um, the settlers of an island. And the idea is that you want to try and use up the resources on this island to build villages and um, towns and roads and basically colonize the island. And the person who most successfully colonizes the island is the winner. Now, it's a great game. Um, there's obviously several issues that exist there around colonization that people have, have talked about very eloquently elsewhere. But one of the issues that myself and my colleague Paul Wake at Manchester Metropolitan University, who I do a lot of my work on games with, one of the things we thought about was, well, this isn't actually a realistic simulation because they're just saying that there's an infinite amount of resources to use on this island. But we know that the more resources you use, the more you're going to be um, basically ramping up the effects of greenhouse gases and global warming. So we made an expansion for this game called Catan Global Warming in which your actions actually have a long-term impact in which the resources are finite. And you can take um, decisions that enable you to more intensively take the resources, but then that, then that has a much larger impact, negative impact on the island as a um, ecosystem more largely. And you can read about this game and, and, and download it as an expansion um, in that link that I've put at the bottom. And what this game really does is it gets people when, when they're playing the game, thinking about how you can use um, games to talk about topics such as global warming. You're negotiating this space. You, one of the ways in which you do this is at the start of the game, you determine what the end game conditions are going to be like. You know, Will you destroy the island if you use up all of the resources? Will something else slightly different happen? So by negotiating those contracts, you're starting to have those conversations. However, is this dialogue? Now, this work um, that Paul and I have done, you know, was, was quite successful. It was written about in The Guardian, et cetera. Lots of people, like thousands of people have played this game. But again, it was Paul and I picking something that we thought was cool, that we thought was interesting, and then hoping that conversations would occur as a result of it. To some extent, this is still a one-way method of communication. It's Paul and I, in this instance, deciding what's interesting and then hoping that other people will listen to that and follow suit. Where games are really powerful, like with poetry, is actually in how we can think about developing that two-way dialogue. And one of the ways we can do that is by co-creating games. So I want to talk to you about a game called Carbon City Zero. So this is a game that Paul and I um, developed for the climate charity Possible. And we co-created this with lots of different stakeholders. So we worked with activists, with policymakers, with students, with um, school children, with industry experts, with um, various other publics and asked them, what do you think is important about creating a zero emission city? What are the challenges? What needs to be done? And we had several sessions where we went and got people's opinions. And then we started to design the prototype. And then we went to play test this game with hundreds of people, got their input, iterated the game, improved it, listened to their thoughts, etc. So you can see that there was various stages of the game development, ranging from um, initial design and discussion sessions through to play testing, through to you know, the, the final testing of the game. And this involved many hundreds of people and it was a real co-creation um, process. And what was really interesting about this as well was that as well as the game development, there was the design development. And I just wanna show you this slide here. So you can see that um, on the left is the prototype card that Paul and I initially started with once we had these thoughts about what the game should look like from these various communities. Then we created something that you could play and play test with the second image. And then the third image is basically the limit of our design skills. We then involved a 
artist, um, Tony Pickering, and a graphic designer, Matt Bonner, to make it much better, which is this image here. And then, and this is really important, we got a um, accessibility teardown by Michael Heron, who's an expert on accessibility in games, because we really wanted to make the game as accessible as possible to people um, who might have um, visual impairments, who might have cognitive impairments, etc. So we worked with him. He runs an organization called Meeple Like Us. And we then ended up on this final design, which is more streamlined and which helps um, to make the game more accessible. Um, like so small things, for example, like as well as having color coded, um, as well as having colored cards, you also want to have a symbol so that um, people who are colorblind aren't necessarily um, prejudiced by the game. So this was really great because it demonstrates why you should involve as many people as possible because you can't be good at everything. Um, and Paul and I are good at designing games, but we have limited design and art skills, which is why it was great to involve Tony Pickering and Matt Bonnet. And we were really, Carbon City Zero was great. Um, and we ended up putting it on Kickstarter, making about 20,000 pounds and sending it out to several hundred people, which was great. And then we got feedback and they were like, this game's fantastic. But in this game, you are a city mayor and you're competing against other city mayors to create the world's most carbon zero city, the world's first carbon zero city. But why aren't we collaborating with each other instead? To which Paul and I had no response whatsoever, other than that's a good point. We're going to have to redesign the game. So we created a new version of the game called Carbon City Zero World Edition, um, which you can see here. And in this game, players do collaborate together and create together. And again, this got backed on Kickstarter, made just over £20,000, which is amazing. And it's being shipped out to close to a thousand people now. Um, so this is a great example of listening to people in that co-creative process to create a game that enables dialogue to take place and also just to create something that was ultimately better. If we hadn't listened to people, if we hadn't established this dialogue, then we wouldn't have had anywhere near as good a game as we ended up with. You can play these games for free yourself. Um, so you can download them as a free print and play file, uh, PNP, from a website called PNP Arcade. Just go onto PNP Arcade and type in Carbon City Zero and also Carbon City Zero World Edition. And you can download it um, and play it on Tabletopia, which is a digital simulation environment where you can play tabletop games for free. Carbon City Zero is on there. Carbon City Zero World Edition will be coming shortly. So the... Th these games, um, and in particular Carbon City Zero World Edition, give you an example of how we can start to develop dialogue. You know, in, in co-creating these games, we had so many conversations between so many different stakeholders about what is important with a Carbon Zero City. And we know that these games are already being used in planning offices, in schools, in, in various locations across the UK and, and beyond as well um, to start these dialogues. If you're interested in helping us translate this game into other languages, we've got German and Dutch on the cards at the moment. Please get in touch with us as we want to make this game as accessible and as free to as many people as possible so that we can start these dialogues everywhere. So just to return to this original hypothesis then I had at the start that poetry in games can be used to engender dialogue, giving voice to those audiences that are normally underheard and underserved by science and science communication. I hope that the examples I've shown from my own research demonstrate how this can be done th through poetry, in which creating poetry together grants permission to the non-scientists to share their ideas, grants permission to the scientists to share their pathos, and creates a shared sense of vulnerability in which meaningful dialogue can take place. And in the use of tabletop games where we um, negotiate contracts around a tabletop that enable us to leave behind hierarchies of intellect that exist away from the tabletop and the next stage where we co-create games together so that we can hear these voices so that we can hear all of the meaningful input that's needed to start these dialogues but also to create better games to create better poetry as well i just want to finish with a, a call to collaborate um, and to ask you if you'd want to collaborate i, I was really very honored to be asked to give this presentation to this amazing conference 
and I want to use it as a platform to say I'm really interested in working with people who want to use poetry or games or any other art form to start to develop dialogues between scientists and non-scientists and to start helping diversify science and to help more people participate and to stop the idea that science is for certain people and not for others. Science is for everyone. And we need to work out ways that we can help to develop that dialogue, not just because it's a box ticking exercise, but because listening to the needs and experiences of diverse publics and diverse people mean that we get better solutions to our problems. And we come up with ideas that we'd never be able to think of by ourselves. So I have many limitations as, a, as an individual person, which is why I love to collaborate, because then I can work with everybody else's um, amazing thoughts, processes, expertise and knowledge. So please, please get in touch. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this presentation, but also if you want to write research papers together, if you want to put grants in together, if you want to write poetry together, if you just want to hang out and play games together, get in contact with me, please. Thank you very much for listening. Do reach out to me on Twitter or via my website. And I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>